Hi, I'm Lorenzo and uh, if you don't already know me on YouTube, this is my first video completely in English, so please forgive my bad pronunciation. The computer you are watching this video on is a classical computer. I mean, if you are watching this video in 2022, if you are watching it in 2100, I cannot say anything about your computer. And a classical computer means that it can store information and perform calculations on a string of classical bits, of zeros and ones. You can basically think of a bit as a switch that can be off, representing the state 0, or on, representing the state 1. Any kind of information can be represented as a sequence of bits, a string of zeros and ones, from numbers, of course, but also to words or ideas. And in fact, if you had to take away a single message from this video, that should be that as uh, the German-American physicist Rolf Landauer first pointed out, information is physical. I would say that this concept, that information is physical, has the same significance and profoundness as uh, the fact that uh, nature is made up of atoms. As the knowledge of the fact that uh, everything that surrounds us uh, is uh, made of uh, protons, neutrons and electrons is paramount to understand any kind of physical phenomenon, so the knowledge that uh, information is something more than our brain's projection, is something physical that can be manipulated, has been the spark of the age of information that starting from the middle of last century has given us all the marvelous technological things that we use in our everyday life. As the years passed by, the switches that represent bits uh, that I was mentioning before, and which are actually called transistors, have been miniaturized more and more, and we are basically reaching a point in which, uh, if we want uh, to perform more complex calculations, it is no more feasible to pack uh, more and more uh, transistors on smaller and smaller computer chips. When dealing with uh, such small things, uh, our intuitive understanding of reality breaks down. In fact, uh, for example, if while playing pool it is an easy task to calculate the trajectories and the speeds of the balls, uh, well, when dealing with atoms and electrons, it is impossible to tell at the same time what is the speed and the position. This indeterminacy, which has the celebrated name of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, lies at the core of quantum mechanics, which is our best description of nature, and therefore a whole new set of rules applies. Quantum mechanics has been so successful as a theory that the invention of the transistor itself can be regarded as one of its highest peaks. So basically, the computer you have on your desk already works because of quantum mechanics, and if we had not understood well how small things behave, then it would not have been possible to build such a machine. On the other hand, quantum mechanics poses limits on how small transistors can be, and therefore this is the reason why I'm talking about quantum computers in this video. Actually, the real reason why I'm making this video is because I got so hyped about quantum computing after this week, which I spent at my first conference ever. Indeed, I've started my PhD at ETH in Zurich last October, and I was lucky enough to have the possibility to go to Arosa, on the Swiss Alps, to participate to the Winter School and the general meeting that was organized there by the QCIT a collaboration of the most brilliant minds of Switzerland, and I would say also of the world, which is actively pushing the field of quantum technologies to its highest peaks. Quantum computers are already a real thing, and the reason why you should be excited about this, if you are not already, is that they offer incredible possibilities to deepen our understanding of the world, but also many practical uses, if you are more interested about that. The first that, of course, comes to mind is uh, cryptography. In fact, uh, in a world uh, where uh, war means uh, less soldiers on the fields and more cyber attacks, uh, then uh, the possibility of uh, quantum cryptography becomes uh, really important and crucial for security. But the reason why Feynman in the 1980s came up with the idea of the quantum computer in the first place is to simulate quantum things with the quantum things themselves using, instead of the bits, the zeros and the ones that I was mentioning before, their quantum counterparts, the qubits, 
the quantum bits. Imagine, for example, how great it would be to simulate the behavior of a molecule or of a protein and how much of an impact that would have on medicine, for example. But of course, if you're into science, you would be excited by the concept itself that we can predict how a quantum system behaves in the first place. But why would quantum computers be more powerful than classical computers? So let's first point out that quantum computers are not in the way of substituting classical computers for things such as browsing the internet or watching videos or writing documents. Their purpose is entirely different and it relies on quantum algorithms that are completely different from the classical ones. For such things such as simulating a quantum system, indeed, the number of operations that we would need on a classical computer would be exponentially large. And so here the quantum computers show their advantage to the fact that the number of operations would be exponentially reduced, thus allowing us to get a solution in a reasonable amount of time and with limited resources. The first thing to achieve so, which is necessary but not sufficient, is the qubit, the quantum bit, which as opposed to the classical bit, which I was mentioning before, and which can either be in the state 0 or in the state 1, can actually be in any superposition of these states, in which both states 0 and 1 are occupied with a certain proportion, which is called the amplitude. The thing that you have to understand is the fact that these qubits stay in this superposition until you measure them. And in this case, they will give exactly 0 or 1 with a certain probability, which is exactly the square modulus of the amplitude, which I was mentioning before. The fact that within quantum mechanics you have to deal with probabilities is woven into nature itself. But this does not at all mean that we cannot predict what uh, will be the evolution of the amplitudes uh, under the operations that we make uh, on the qubits. It only means that when measuring the state of a qubit, we cannot say for sure, in many cases, what will the result be. The superposition, which is uh, the fact that a qubit can be in any linear combination of the states 0 and 1, however, is not enough. Entanglement is what uh, really makes a quantum computer quantum. To understand this, uh, Think first about many classical bits. To describe what is the state of n classical bits, you only need to specify what their n values are, either 0 or 1. So you need exactly n bits of information. On the other hand, n qubits can be in any superposition of these 2 to the power of n states, and therefore you will need 2 to the power of n complex numbers, actually one less because of normalization, to describe their state, and they are called, as before, the amplitudes. There are actually some nuances that I am purposely leaving out, such as how to deal with quantum information and how much information can you actually extract when you measure a qubit. But we can already understand that the fact that many qubits can be entangled and therefore their state can be any superposition of an exponentially large number of states enables us to achieve results that would need an unlimited amount of resources on a classical computer, as I was mentioning before. Of course, to exploit entanglement is not at all a trivial task, and this is why experimental physicists and engineers are struggling to implement qubits that can survive for longer and longer times in their state, and also they want to correct the errors that happen when qubits interact with the external environment. This is also the reason why theoretical physicists and mathematicians are struggling to devise complex algorithms that enable us to manipulate the qubits in such an efficient way that when we measure them in the end, we obtain the correct result to our problem. Algorithms that rely on quantum computing to perform, for example, the factorization of large numbers, that is, the Shor algorithm that could break down all the cryptography, the classical cryptography which we are using now to protect our credit cards, as soon as we have a computer with enough qubits, have already been discovered during the last century as algorithms that enable us to perform searches in a more optimized way. They are only waiting for machines that can implement those algorithms in a large-scale fashion. 
There would be so many things that I would like to say to you about quantum computing and I'm so excited about this after this week that I hope that I've at least transmitted some of this enthusiasm to you too. For my Italian speaking followers, last year I actually spoke about quantum computing on a live on Twitch that I share at the link above. And I ask you to comment below if you are interested about this topic to treat in future videos. Of course, leave a thumb up and subscribe to the channel if you like this video. And uh, I cannot end this video before having thanked the QCIT, the Swiss National Science Foundation, my supervisors and all the organizers of the Winter School and the General Meeting that I had uh, the pleasure and I was very happy to participate in. See you at the next video.